Good evening, West. God bless you. Amen. Thank you for joining. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Bless his holy name. Hey, God bless you. Thank you for joining tonight. Hallelujah. Amen. We're going to go ahead and get started. The word of God says, where there's two or three gathered in the name of the Lord, he's in the midst. And truly, God is in our midst tonight. And we're going to continue to where we left off on last week, discussing how spiritual vagabonds are born, how spiritual vagabonds are born. And I really believe this lesson is very enriching and insightful to those who are hungry and thirsting after the word of God, where God can give you a revelation, understanding how this word can apply to your life. Good evening, son. God bless you. Thank you for joining. Amen. Let's open up in a word of prayer and then we can go into our lesson. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, you are omniscient, omniscient, and omnipresent, God. Father, you're everything that we need, oh God. We thank you, you know everything, and you are the strength and the source of our life. Tonight, oh God, I ask that you speak to our hearts by divine revelation from the Holy Spirit. Give us insight and understanding of the word of God that we'll be able to apply to our hearts to bring change in our lives forever. We ask that you help us to grow in grace and knowledge of who you are. Cleanse our minds and our hearts, oh God, from the busyness of the day and, and anything that's not of you in our hearts, oh God, that we know is not of you. Purge it out by your fire, God, that make us pure in your presence. And we thank you as your word declares you are cleansed through the words that I have spoken unto you. And we stand on the word, Father, as we stay connected to the vine, which is Jesus Christ, oh God. We will continue to be clean in your presence, God. We thank you that you have your way on tonight, have dominion and authority in our lives. We give you glory, give me honor, give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Again, we thank you all for tuning in tonight. Those of you who just came on, God bless you. And just pray that this word will be enriching to your soul tonight to help inspire, to edify, and build you up in your faith, to trust God at his word. Because truly, God is doing an awesome thing in our lives. And if we pay attention in the spirit, we'll hear God's voice speaking to our hearts to perfect the thing that concerns our life, that nothing will hinder us from walking in truth and righteousness. We began our lesson last week from the bait of Satan, the book, Living Free from Deadly Traps of Fest, with the discussion how spiritual vagabonds are born. And we came to understand that vagabonds are a type of spirit that will keep you restless, keep you living a life as a drifter, never coming to an understanding and revelation who God is in your life, what God says about you, become a beggar and a pauper because the mindset can't see themselves being set free. And one thing about a vagabond, this spirit of, of a vagabond is people that be in the churches of God who always are looking for accusations in other people and never find any fault with themselves. They become narcissistic. They become people of, uh, who don't care about nobody else but about themselves and, and they want to find uh, people to take a, uh, revenge in their own hands when things are not done right, that they feel should be right in the church, that they feel they have the power and the ability to correct even pastors and leaders in the church. When you have to walk in humility and wisdom, and we walk in wisdom, if it's something that's not going right in the house of God, God will give you wisdom on how to deal with those situations and those issues at hand through the word of God. And it's very important to recognize that as you're wandering aimlessly from church to church, you never settle. A vagabond spirit will keep you never settling in a house of God to a set place where God wants you to be. You're always looking, always trying to find a word from God. There's a lot of people, I remember a movement back in the early 90s, the prophetic movement where people was where Ronnie, where prophets would show up in different places to get a word from God. So the, if a church was having a, a service on the east side, we'd run over there. 
because there's a, a well-known prophet going to be there to get a word from God. Or we go to the west or to the north or to the south looking for a word. When the word is nigh thee, even in your mouth, the word of faith that we preach. So we miss the word of God speaking to us because I'm looking out the carnal mindset trying to find a word from God. When all you got to do is open up your Bible, begin to read your Bible, the word will give you a word from God. It's a guarantee you will find an answer to many of life's situations and issues in your life and problems you're dealing with and troubles in the word of God. We talked about last week how the spirit was one that even called Saul to chase after David. Because he couldn't settle in himself. He was jealous of David because God appointed David to be the next king. And Saul became angry in himself because he rebelled against God. If you read the story in 1 Samuel, the whole book, you find out when God appointed Saul to be king in 2 Samuel. And so much happened in the book of Samuel. When God appointed King Saul to be the king, and when God gave him specific instructions, to kill a certain group of people called the Malachites. He rebelled against God and he lost his position because he was stubborn and prideful and arrogant. You got a lot of people who exhaust themselves. I asked a question to my mother a couple of days ago. And I asked her, because there's a lot of uh, uh, havoc being wreaked in the church. And I ask this question, how can a carnal person be exalted in the Lord? And she said the answer is not God doing it, it's them themselves exalting themselves. And that's when you find yourself being puffed up in your own self-righteousness. Self-righteousness will cause to be exalted temporary, and then you have a great fall. Why? Because the spirit of a vagabond will make you begin to see things from the perspective of the natural mind and the natural eyesight of the flesh and not the spiritual eyes of the Holy Spirit. So you find yourself looking and searching for answers for things that only God has the answer to. There are many people in the body of Christ who are spiritually sick. And because they're spiritually sick, it's because a lot of reasons of something God isn't trying to get them to do and they rebelled against God and they haven't done it. So a spirit of infirmity will come upon you because of rebellion. But when you begin to trust God and walk by faith and not by sight in the word of God, whatever God has instructed you to do when you walk by faith and trust God to speak to the mountains of infirmity, guess what? They will move. Sometimes we become afflicted and God gives you the grace to go through it. He may never heal you in this lifetime. But if not, he can't, can't heal you because God has the power to do anything but fail. And if God spoke a word that by a stripes you are healed to Jesus Christ, guess what? You are healed in your spirit. And your body has to manifest the manifestation of the healing by faith, by believing in the word that God has spoken to you. Amen? So we're going a little further. We talked about how David was lodging in a cave and Saul was looking for David and he had a group of men, a bunch of soldiers for one person looking for this one man and God protected David from Saul to when Saul came to the same cave he didn't know David was lodging in, he laid down to go to sleep which was an opportunity for David to get revenge. But David had a relationship with God where he said to himself, 
This is God's anointed. I cannot touch him. So David cut off a piece of his, his garment and he showed it to Saul, said, I could have taken your life, but because of you, God's anointed, I didn't touch you. And Saul still pursued after David, even after that encounter, because he had such malice and hatred and jealousy towards David because God called David and not King Saul called David. And it's, it's a shame how when God begins to exalt you in the house of God, in the kingdom of God, the devil has people strategically planted to assassinate you, to stop you from walking and fulfilling the call on your life and your purpose. But God has a way of protecting you, even maneuvering you past your enemies and still promote you to the place you need to be in him. That's why when he wrote in Psalms chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, he shall direct your path because he got a revelation. That only God has the ability to lift us up when we humble ourselves. So we got to stay in the place of humility and trust God. We talked about last week, how can God use corrupt leaders? Eli and his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, they were wicked. They were rebellious. They were fornicating. They were adultery. They were doing everything under the sun at the temple gate, the door of the temple. And God became displeased with their behavior because they were supposed to be priests. We talked about this, how there are many leaders. You may have heard rumors about the leader. You might even know some facts about the leader. But it's not your right to put salt on a wound that's already hurt. It's not your right to put your mouth on a man or the woman of God because of the things you know about them to spread rumors and gossip. You have to leave the judgment in the hand of the Lord. So God spoke to Samuel when he was a young child and he called Samuel and Samuel got a word from God after God called him three times. He got a prophetic word concerning Eli and his sons. And he had to tell Eli this word, but he didn't tell him until Eli became in inquisitive to want to know what did God speak to you, Samuel? And God told him. And we understand that Eli at this time was a fat man going blind. And God gave him this word Samuel gave him the message from the Lord and told him to get it in order or you and your son are going to die. And it's very important as a child of God, <coughs> excuse me, when God gives you a word of correction for somebody that you know who is doing wrong in the body of Christ, However, you need to come to them with that word in love, not coming with a judgmental criticism mindset, but coming in humility with a prophetic word from God to tell somebody to get their life in order. The Bible tells us, I believe in our Galatians chapter 6 and 2, it tells us, that we are to bear one another's burden, so fulfill the law of Christ. Knowing that if a brother be caught in the fall, it says, go to him and restore him in the spirit of meekness. Lest ye, talking about you, talking about me, also fall in the same manner or the same temptation. Because one thing about it, he who thinks he stand, take heed lest you fall. And that's a guarantee. That's natural law. 
If you don't humble yourself and walk in obedience to God's word, you leave yourself open for the attack of the enemy to come into your life, into your ministry, into your home, into your children, into your marriage, to your relationship to destroy you. Because you refuse to walk the way God says to walk upright with hands pure and clean before his presence. It's very important. Children do not, do not correct the fathers. The fathers correct the children. God had a problem with Cain in Genesis chapter 4. When you go to verse 11, Genesis chapter 4, verse 11, we talked about this last week. You read Genesis chapter 4, you find out that Cain and Abel were the two sons of Adam and Eve. And they were required to bring an offering before the Lord. Cain's offering was not pure. It wasn't from the heart. Abel's offering was what God was looking for. A heart that surrendered. A heart that wants to yield to God and love God and give God the best of what he had. And that's the thing that caused jealousy in the beginning of time. And because of that, Cain killed his brother. And when he killed his brother, let's go to verse 9. Genesis chapter 4, verse 9. And the Lord said unto Cain, where is Abel, thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? How many times have you had yourself speaking that same way when someone approached you about something you done, you got some type of excuse to try to get out of it? And he said, what thou hast done, the voice of thy brother's blood cries unto me from the ground. Isn't that something? The blood cries out. The sin cries out to God. Whatever it is you've done and you try to conceal it, try to hide it, it still cries out to God from the heart. Because God says, I know the heart and I try the reins and I will render to every man according to the fruit of doing. So God knows your heart. And guess what? The silent answers. God says, I hear it. Because he knows when you're in a position where you're telling the truth or you're trying to manipulate your way out of a lie. <coughs> Excuse me. And God told Cain, Say, so where's your brother? What do you do with him? He said, his blood cries from the ground. Verse 11, And now art thou cursed from the earth, which has opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. God cursed them. From that day forward, Cain was cursed because of the actions of that he did out of jealousy to kill his brother. We do it in the church today. We kill one another with our mouths. We kill one another with our negative thoughts, our rumors, our gossip, our slanders, our backbiters, our hating on people. We kill one another because our hearts are still holding on to unforgiveness. Unforgiveness would keep you in a place that's dark and dreary and gloomy, alienated from God's glory, being revealed in your life. My God, my God. And one thing about God, he said the blood, it cries from the ground. When you go a little further, verse 12, when thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. In other words, when you till the ground, you're not going to get no harvest. A fugitive, always on the run, a vagabond. He said, a fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. All because of his selfish actions. He killed his brother. He had to live his life 
always on the run. A vagabond, pauper, a beggar, always needing a handout, always need somebody to help you. Can't do for yourself. Why? Because I put myself in a place that God didn't intend for me to be there because of rebellion. One thing about God, when God begins to give you a revelation about yourself, folk get mad. They get angry because I'm not ready to receive it. I'm not ready to let go of my unforgiveness. I'm not ready to let go of my sin, <coughs> my issues. So I hold on to the things that God is trying to purge out of me. I keep it treasured in my heart. My treasure box. I talk about this in previous lessons. How everybody has a treasure box in their heart. And that treasure box holds your secrets, the things you're holding on that's not of God or the things that are of God. But most of the time, we harbor in our hearts, in our treasure box, the things that God's trying to get rid of in our lives. Because I'm not ready to let go. So he said, you're going to be a vagabond? You're going to always be on the run as a fugitive. People will always be after you. And guess what? The devil's always after you. You're a fugitive. When you rebel against God and you refuse to repent and turn your life over to the Lord Jesus Christ, you're a fugitive. And the Holy Spirit says that you have to come to the place in yourself and recognize that I'm out of order with God I've been sinning before God. Forgive me, God. Cleanse my mind and my heart. And that's what he'll do for you. The moment you recognize, I can't do it by myself. We're going to go on a little further. Churches aren't cafeterias. Churches aren't cafeterias. You know what a cafeteria is? In Texas, they have cafeterias you can go and, and pay for a lunch or a dinner and you get all you want at this cafeteria. You can go to Golden Corral. That's a cafeteria. They got buffets. Everything spread. The salad bar. The vegetable bar. The meat bar. The, the dessert bar. You go get whatever you want at that cafeteria because you paid your money to get it. But the church is not a cafeteria. Because there's not a place where we are to come in and expect to get things from God, anything we want, if we're not living right. Today men, today, men and women leave churches so readily if they see something wrong in the leadership. Perhaps it is the way the pastor takes offering. Maybe it's the way money is spent. If they don't like what the pastor preaches, check this out. They leave. I don't like the way they collect offering. Some churches got too many offerings. I heard that before. I went to this one church. Somebody told me I went to this one church, and they took about five offerings. I don't like it, so I left the church. Some churches, I don't like the leader. I don't like the way the pastor preach. I don't like the way he dress. I don't like the way he look. I don't, I don't like the way it seems like he's looking at my wife or looking at my husband. So I leave the church. If they don't like what the pastor preaches, they leave. He is either not approachable or he is too familiar. I've been in churches. I don't know what's going on in my voice right now. Excuse it. That was a lie. But I've been in churches where pastors been elevated to bishops or an apostle. The very ones you were friends with when they were in low plane, when a nobody. And they became a minister, then became a pastor. But as soon as the title of a bishop or apostle was attached to their name, they became unapproachable. You can't even come near them because now they got bodyguards. Everywhere they go to church, their bodyguards is going before them, so you can't come near them. But before they became well known, they were humble. You can call them when you had an issue, need the pastor to pray for you. You can go by his house to take him a, a, a cake or a baked good or something that they like. But as soon as their status changed, now they don't know you no more. 
I only know you as a member of the church, and that's far as it's going to be, because now I'm in a different category with other people, and you don't fit in that circle. This list doesn't end. Rather than face difficulties and maintain hope, they run where there appear to be no conflict. But again, check this out. You're not going to find a perfect church. No matter what church you go to, it's going to have a flaw. No matter what church you go to, the leader might have an issue. No matter what church you go to, it might be something you don't like in that church or certain people you don't like in that church. Let's face it. Jesus is the only perfect pastor. You need to write that down. Jesus is the only perfect pastor. So why do we run from difficulties in America instead of facing them and working through them? When we don't hit these conflicts head on, we usually leave offended. That is a very vital point for a believer to understand, not just in America, but in the body of Christ. When we don't deal with the conflicts, we leave offended. And God is trying to get you to the place you and I will be mature in the presence of God, in the word of God, by the Holy Spirit, that when the conflicts arise, we have the wisdom and the knowledge and understanding on how to deal with it. Check this out. People, if you haven't already ran into this, they're going to come to you about issues about other people in the body of Christ, in the church. They're going to always try to come to you to make you a dumping ground, to tell you all the mess about other people, but they leave out the facts about themselves. And when the Holy Spirit is listening. Check this out. When the Holy Spirit is listening, the Holy Spirit will begin to reveal to you the carrier of the message is holding back a vital part of the information. And you be spiritual. We begin to hear what God is saying and begin to pray for those individuals. And pray that God will bring conviction to their hearts. That they will tell the whole truth and not part of the truth. When you go before the judge, a magistrate, in a court of law, they have you swear in the right hand. I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. God holds you accountable. You are responsible. I am responsible to uphold the standard of the Lord by telling the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do not compromise. I don't care how juicy the information is that someone brings to you. If it's not of God, the Holy Spirit will begin to prick your heart to recognize deception in the matter and begin to pray and then speak a word that God tells you to speak to bring conviction to their heart, to change their life. I, I, I didn't mean to say all that tonight, but that's in, the, that's in the spirit tonight because somebody needs to hear that. Don't allow yourself to get into a predicament where you find yourself leaving offended because you couldn't deal with conflicts. We're so quick. This is one thing I learned being in ministry for 38 years. As of August 19th, 1985, I've been in ministry for, 80, for uh, uh, 30, 38 years. And one thing I learned is that no matter where you go in life, when people have a disagreement with you and you don't deal with it, you hold it in your heart. I, I was the type of person. I will keep stuff buried in my heart. You make me mad, I bury it in my heart. If I don't like something about you, I bury it in my heart. Until I became a pressure cooker. Because a pressure cooker, 
You can take some greens or whatever you want to steam in that thing. And the pressure begins to build. And as it builds and builds and builds, if you don't release the steam before opening the cap, it explodes on you. I've done that before. My heart was just like that, young in ministry. And I was a pressure cooker, holding on to all the hurts and the pains and the abuse and all the stuff that people dumped on me and how they mistreated me for many years. Held on all that stuff. And when someone came along who was just as innocent and humble and said something that sounded like it was offensive, I just exploded on that one person. They didn't deserve it. But because I harbored that mess for so long, I hurt innocent people. Preached and hurt innocent people. And God says tonight, as his children, you need to let go of the dumping ground. Let go of the junk that people bombard you with and let it go that God would deal with it. Not you, because he said, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Romans 12 and 11, I believe it is. So he will deal with it. When you are willing to let God handle it. And so many people, when their status change, they get puffed up, become arrogant, and become prideful, and don't care about nobody else but what they're doing for themselves. They try to make a name for themselves, try to exalt themselves among people to be better than what they really are, to make them seem like something they're not. Why? Because I want you to love me because of what I'm doing. You know what I learned in ministry? It's not about me. It's about him being glorified. When I humble myself before the mighty hand of God, God will lift me up in due season in the status he ordained to be in my life in its proper season. That's a word for somebody tonight. We're going to move on. Sometimes we say our prophetic ministries just was not received. We then go from church to church looking for a place with flawless leaders. Mm, my God. So you feel like your gifts, you feel like the talents that God has given you is not received in a certain church. So I'm mad, I leave and go to another church. I'm looking for a flawless, a perfect leader. Someone who does not exemplify any type of error. So I'm looking for that type of person who I can follow, not knowing they have flaws too. We all have flaws. The more you live in this life, you're going to have flaws. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to stumble. You're going to fall down. But one thing about God, he said the righteous man falleth seven times. Then the Lord would do what? Lift him up again. It's a guarantee when you come to God and say, God, I made a mistake. I, I, I did this. I shouldn't have done that. I said these things to people I shouldn't have said. I hurt folk. You be honest with God, guess what? God will take your heart. He'll purify it. He'll make you clean in his presence. Because the sacrifice already been paid for your redemption. So there's no perfect pastor. No perfect church. As I write this book, this author says, as I write this book, I have been a member at only two churches in two different states in the last 14 years. I have had more than two, in fact, numerous opportunities to become offended with the leadership over me, most of which I might add, stem from my own fault or immaturity. Ain't that something? The author of this book said in 14 years, he served under only two churches. And numerous facts, many occasions, a reason to become offended, which only came from the heart of his own faults and his own lack of growth. Immaturity means lack of growth. 
So he recognized that this was me and not the people I was blaming. That's a whole nother message. Blaming other people for your own immaturity. Blaming other people for your own immaturity. It's their fault. I don't know the word of God. It's their fault. The pastor didn't teach me what I felt he should have taught me. It's their fault. They didn't do this or do that. So I want to blame somebody else for something I feel that's their fault. But all the time, I haven't been praying. I haven't been studying the word of God. I haven't been asking God to give me wisdom and understanding. You know one thing, when I was 60 years old, my father made me a junior deacon in church. And he gave me assignments. My assignment was to read particular scriptures that he gave me. And then come back and give him a revelation of what that scripture is talking about. And one of my favorite scriptures was uh, St. John chapter 1 and 1. In the beginning was the word, the word was God, the word was God. One of my favorite scriptures. And I came back to my dad with a revelation of what God gave me about that scripture. And my father was pleased because of that. So he sent me over to Sunday school as a junior superintendent. He started teaching me, grooming me, priming me for leadership. But me being young and dumb and stupid didn't want to learn. So I, I was getting to a place in myself. Why is he making me read all this? Why make me do this? Why make me do that? I didn't want to do those things. I want to live my life like my friends were doing. But I thank God that he instilled in me a study mentality because it taught me years later to be who I am today because of many different people, pastors, bishops, prophets, teachers, evangelists, have sown into my life through many years. The foundational principle of the word of God was taught me how to be a leader today that I am. So stop blaming people for your fault. I had the chance to become critical and judgmental with leadership, but leaving, but leaving was not the answer. In the midst of every, in the midst of a very trying situ circumstances, one day the Lord spoke to me through the scriptures and verse and said, "This is, this is, this is the way I want you to leave the church. You should go out with joy and be led forth with peace." Isaiah chapter fifty-five, verse twelve. Whenever you leave a church, you should never leave a church mad or angry because you didn't like the way the church was. There are seasons where God would take you to a certain place to be there, to pour into a ministry, to guess the talent he's giving you, and then move you onto some other place. But you shall leave with joy and be led out with peace because the Spirit of God would tell you now your season is up. It's time to go to another place, to, to learn more, to grow to another platform of ministry. There are many places I've been throughout my life in ministry, but each place I've went, I gained more knowledge and understanding and more truth about God's word, which elevated me in my growth. So any place you go, it should be a place where you desire God to teach you. My dad taught us as children you got to have a teachable spirit. If you don't have a teachable spirit, you're going to be a knucklehead, going to be a dummy in life. And I thank God he taught me that. And I want to encourage somebody tonight, study your word. Get in your Bible. Don't let it be a showpiece on your table. Read your Bible. Because when you read your Bible, God will give you a revelation. If this word is touching, I want to see some hearts on here tonight. If this word touches, send up some hearts on here tonight. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I'm loving this lesson because it's teaching me some more. Then he goes on, said, most do not lead this way. They think churches are like cafeterias. They can pick and choose what they like. My God, my God, my God. That is so true. Many people get in church. I don't like the praise team. I got an altercation with a brother or sister in the church. Instead of reconciling, I got angry and decided to leave the church. I want to pick in church what I like. 
I like the music, but I want to hear the message. I like good music. I like good songs, but I don't want to learn nothing. I want to go to church just to say I went to church. We talked about this before, how many people come to church for many different reasons. Some come to say, I went to church. Some come because they need spiritual healing. Some come because they need deliverance. Some come just to be coming. Some love the music. Some love the way people uh, uh, praise God. Whatever your reason is, God's house is not a cafeteria. They feel the freedom to stay as long as there are no problems. They feel to stay as long as there are no problems. My God, my God. But this does not agree at all with the, what the Bible teaches. You're not the one who chooses where to go to church. God does. You hear what I said? You're not the one to choose what church to go to only God does. The Holy Spirit inside of you would tell you what church you need to be in at the time and season of your life. Because God has something for you to hear, learn, and receive in your heart to change your life. You might be a vagabond. You might be a person who feel like a vagabond spirit. You've been wandering from church to church for over and over and over doing the same old things, the same old cycle, running from job to job, never being still. God has said tonight, I have a plan, I have a thought that I think towards you to prosper you and do you no harm and give you an expected end. Jeremiah 29, 11, God knows what he has set in motion for your life to receive at a certain time of your life and a certain place you need to be in the season of your life. But you're only going to recognize and know it when you hear the voice of God by humility, humbling yourself. And say, God, speak to me. Show me where I need to go. You might run across somebody in a grocery store or a department store and they, have, they go to a certain church and God said, get this information, go to that church. And you go to that church, and it's just the place God has for you to be. The Bible does not say God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as they please. But rather, it says, but now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. As he pleased. So every member of the body of Christ have been set in the church where they need to be, where God wants them to be, to help build one another. I need you, you need me. We're all a part of God's body. And we have to have the heart of humility to encourage and build one another up. Remember that. If you're in the place where God wants you, the devil will try to offend you to get you out of it. If you're in a place where God wants you to be, as a guarantee, the devil is lurking about, seeking, and roaring like a lion whom he may devour. Whatever place you are at in your life, in ministry, the status that God has placed you in. The devil is looking for a foothold in your life to offend you, to abandon your position. He wants you to quit. He wants you to give up. He wants you to say, I want the use of living. Let me take my life. Because he knows if I can get you to quit, then you won't give God the glory. Because it's all about the glory. It's about your life and my life. It's about giving God the glory. Because God says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. So I need to give God the glory. And when I recognize that this is the tactic of the enemy coming into my life to stop me from what God wants me to do, 
guess what? The Holy Spirit will tell you, warning, be careful, be on guard. There's a snake in the field. I had a dream about snakes a week ago. And in this dream, I was in the field. And all these snakes were coming from every direction, surrounding me. And not one of them was able to come near me. And God will sometimes show you in a dream that in the house, there might be a snake in that house that's coming against you. But you got to be able to be discerning in your spirit and recognize that there's an enemy in the camp. And let God begin to reveal to you how to approach and deal with that enemy in your camp. And sometimes your silence is the best weapon. You ain't got to argue with people. You ain't got to fight with people, with flesh with flesh. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principles and powers and rules of darkness of the age and spiritual wickedness in high places. You have to sometimes let the battle belong to the Lord. When heavenly armor comes in like a flood, the battle belongs to the Lord. When those armies come in against you, God said they're going to flee because I fight for you. Glory to God in the iron. My God, my God, my God. He wants to uproot men and women from the place where they are, where God plants them. If he can get you out, he has been successful. If he gets you out where you are placed where God wants you to be, he's been successful. His mission has been fulfilled. If you will not budge, even in the midst, check this out. Even in the midst of great conflict, you will spoil his plans. That is so powerful. Even in the midst of great conflicts, you refuse to give in to the enemy's tactics. God says you overcome because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And the enemy cannot stop you from fulfilling the call and the plan and the will that God has for your life. He can only deter and try to delay you there. So we're going to stop right here. And next week, we're going to pick up talking about critical deception, critical deception. And I tell you, when you listen with a spiritual ear, he that has an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. When the Spirit speaks to the church and we come together in one accord, God will reveal when snakes are in the camp. And we'll begin to praise God and worship and glorify God in the midst of those snakes. Guess what? The Lord will drive them out of your camp. Sometimes, we talked about this last week, Sometimes God will set you in a place that's uncomfortable. Sometimes God will put you in a place of confliction to see what your response is going to be. Sometimes God will let people come against you. David had the opportunity over and over, and over to run from Saul, and he ran. But each time Saul got close enough to kill him, God protected David when Saul couldn't even touch him. So you got to be willing to recognize that sometimes God is doing things in our life that's uncomfortable to make us grow in grace and the knowledge of who he is. When you're willing to grow, you're willing to learn. When you're willing to learn, you become teachable. And when you're teachable, you're able to be built up in the kingdom of God as a steward of the gospel. And that's what God wants to be, all of us, wise stewards of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we are held accountable for every idle word that you speak out of your mouth. You have to be careful not to allow the enemy to deceive you, manipulate you, or trick you up to cause you to stumble in a pathway of darkness. For the word of God is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. 
So, Father, in the name of Jesus, God, I thank you for this word tonight. I thank you for the warning, God, to make us aware of where our heart posture is. That we allow you to come into our lives to change us, prune us, perfect us, cleanse us, heal us, deliver us from any sin in our lives, even unforgiveness. And to wash us clean. That we have nothing to hinder us from walking in your presence, God. That you will be glorified. Ask tonight, oh God, that you have your way in our lives. As we walk by faith and not by sight, that you lead God and direct us in the way of truth and the way of righteousness. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So I want everyone to pray this prayer with me, if you will, tonight. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you, Lord, to come into my heart. Forgive me for our sins, knowing and unknowingly, and wash me clean in the blood of the Lamb. Come into my Lord, my heart and be my Lord and Savior. Come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. And I thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, the Lord heard you. Now you're held responsible for that prayer tonight. If you were not saved, didn't know Jesus, your Lord and Savior, and you prayed that prayer, the words that for, for with mouth's confession made the heart man believes unto righteousness. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but shall have, shall have everlasting life. If you prayed that prayer tonight, the whole host of heaven is rejoicing over one sinner that can turn their life over to the Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to thank you all for tuning in tonight, Pastor Cornell. Thank you. I'll see you on that. Pastor Denise and Deborah, God bless you all. Shonda, my friend Cornell, God bless you all. Dennis, God bless you. Uh, Missy, God bless you. Thank you all for tuning in tonight. Uh, Webster, my son, God bless you. God bless you. You all have any questions? Any questions or comments you want to write concerning the lesson tonight? The link is on also. You want to sow a seed into the ministry. Feel free to do so. It is a link on here each week. If you want to sow a seed, feel free to sow that seed and it goes into the ministry. Amen. So any any questions or comments? God bless you. God bless you all. God bless you all. I see there's no comments. No one's typing anything. Okay. Well, the Lord says the same. We will resume again next week at the six o'clock hour and continue our study in the beta say we're gonna finish this book soon hopefully hopefully we're gonna finish this book because this is a really good book to, to learn from and study from if you don't have this book you need to get this book it is a total of 14 chapters 14 chapters in this book and we are just in chapter five so 14 chapters i want to go through this whole book so i really believe this book is going to set somebody free because the way God's instructed me to teach this book, I want to see people free. I want to see people grow in their knowledge and understanding of the word of God. I want to see God heal and deliver us from different issues in our own lives. Because so many things we go through in this life, no one knows about but you and God. And God wants us to come together tonight to recognize his presence and allow him to heal, deliver, and set us free from the inside out. My pastor preached a message on Sunday. A meeting in the fire. A meeting in the fire. There was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You might be in a fiery situation right now, but I want to encourage you that God is going to heal and deliver you. Deliver, deliver you excuse me for my words. My the words. He's going to deliver you from the inside out. In the midst of your fiery situation that you encounter, you keep standing on the word of God. Don't doubt God, but trust God in his word for the just shall live by faith. Amen. God bless you all. Stay encouraged. Stay excited about Jesus. Now may the grace of God, the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, rest through the body of us, henceforth now and forevermore until we meet again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a great night, everybody. Amen. Amen. Amen.